this channel, I guess it could be said, covers a lot of ground in terms of role-playing games. We have videos about the way we play. We have videos about games. We have videos about game products. We have actual play videos. Um, we have recaps about the games that I'm a part of and, and on and on. There's a lot of different content here, which means I can't always do things as quickly as I might like. So last week I was given a question by uh, J. Scott Garby, who also has uh, a channel. And it was about running Fantasy Flight Game Star Wars. So it's connected with, you know, that playlist of, of information. And it's a very good question. It's one I thought I had answered before, but I think it was in passing and for the life of me, I can't find it. So I'm making this video response because it is such a good question and it is a problem. Problems may be a harsh word, but it is something that you experience when you sit down to play a Star Wars game and not just Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars, but any Star Wars game. And the question is, how do you decide what will and will not be a part of your Star Wars. There's so much of Star Wars out there. There's what's represented canonically in the films. There's what's represented in the comics and in all the novelizations and so on and so on. And not everybody appreciates all the films. <laughs> and as you know, we're waiting for the release of Force Awakens, who knows what fan reaction is going to be like. We're all so filled with hope right now, a new hope, that uh, things could be awful if we are let down in some way. But right now, the Star Wars universe is a bright, bright place. And there's so much stuff to talk about. So when you pitch Star Wars to a group of people, they all know what you mean but they might not know what you don't mean. And that conversation can be difficult. If you're playing Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars, part of this question has been, has been dealt for you. They make this a little bit easier with the way that the core material is divided into Edge of the Empire, Age of Rebellion, and Force and Destiny. Although this does come with the feeling of how play will be run being changed as well. Like Edge lending itself more to an open, ongoing campaign format, age having an easier time running mission-oriented play or with military structures and, and that sort of thing. They, the way that the book is written makes it a lot easier to do those than, let's say, Edge would. And Force and Destiny being, you know, so focused on the experience of a Force user. So uh, we can look at the, the series as a progression Edge of the Empire being open, almost the generic Star Wars game for the line. It's not, but almost. Age of Rebellion being a little more focused and giving you, you know, threads of support and opportunity for, you know, the activities of the Rebellion against the Galactic Empire. And structures in play, such as Duty, which make it easier to run mission-oriented play. Here's your mission, here are your resources, go! Yeah. And then ending up in Force and Destiny, which would be the most narrowly focused. You know, force users are your characters. And although there are different types of Force users from different backgrounds and different species and so on, still, you're playing Force users. And the internal life, the moral struggles, the ethical struggles, the the struggle to even learn more about the Force, the oppression of the Galactic Empire and its, and its desire to stamp out um, any hint of like an organized religion around the Force. You know, this is your gameplay, kind of a, a small group quest-based campaign from a certain point of view. How do you set all of this up? How do you choose your game? If you're playing one of the other games, which attempted to package all of Star Wars in between one set of covers, of course, you're dealing with lots and lots of supplements and which one of those are going to be valid or not. So coming into Star Wars as a game master with a group of varying levels of experience, which is likely, 
how do you have the conversation about what's going to be included? That's what this video is going to try to address. Now, the question on my channel specifically asked about, you know, our experience when we were setting up the campaign that, that we've been running uh, now for so long. I think that's a good place to start. I like to have, you know, practical examples, and this certainly is one. When we first talked about playing Star Wars, the very first thing that we discussed was the prequels. There really wasn't anybody in the group of the six of us, five players and, and myself, who really have a lot of love for the prequels. There's stuff in the prequels that we like, but we're not, you know, entirely enamored of how things were handled and, and uh, yeah. But once we started going through Edge of the Empire, which is the only one that had been released at the time, once we started going through it, well, we really liked how it handled the material. And it didn't really confront us with any of the things from the prequels that we didn't like. So that was kind of nice. It didn't really confront us with anything that we didn't like at all. And in fact, we wouldn't actually encounter anything in any of the lines that doesn't appeal to us until we get to the little box text about midi-chlorians in Force and Destiny. And the way that was included was masterfully done. Leaving things open for inclusion or exclusion is a fantastic way to go, particularly if you're targeting, well, a very broad age group. I mean, playing Star Wars now, you're going to have people my age and older, and you're going to have people who are just getting into role-playing games for the very first time, who might not even be teenagers yet. It's a pretty expansive age group, and the amount of time, the amount of effort that's been devoted into you know, learning about that universe was going to vary widely. Now, in our campaign, pretty much uh, we decided right from the very beginning that anything that happened in the prequels would be hearsay, rumor, gossip, um, in parts, the official story, you know, distorted for your benefit by the Galactic Empire, that sort of stuff. So it was something that we could draw on when needed, and it was something that we could safely ignore as canon. That's what we decided. Then there was the even larger issue of the expanded universe. Now, the Game Master, myself, I hadn't explored the expanded universe pretty much at all, other than the fantastic material that had been created for the D6 game, the West End Games, Star Wars, long, long ago. So I knew I'd be drawing upon some of that fantastic material, and maybe there had been no exposure to any of it, from the players. I wanted the freedom to be able to do that, especially because I knew that with five players, there'd be a tremendous load of improvisation on me for just, you know, being able to pull planets out of nowhere or species or, you know, different inter interactions and character types. So I wanted to be able to, to fall back on that knowledge, but I didn't want people to have to feel like they need to be an expert in it. And we had a few people who had played every Star Wars video game and were intimately aware. And as soon as we started, you know, talking about playing Star Wars, they started playing those games again. So I knew they would want to be able to draw on that information as well. What would be treated as canon? We established right away that whatever happens in play is our canonical Star Wars universe. And then I said, if you want to bring something in from the expanded universe, then, you know, let's agree on that. Let's bring it up and discuss it at that time, because there's just so much stuff. And that was, you know, a very quick discussion and we were done and we've been playing now. We're, we're closing in on two years and this has never really been an issue for us. And I'll give you one example. There is in the expanded universe reference to this place, like the smuggler's haven, the smuggler's moon, this Nar Shaddaa. You know, if you get the, the source book Lords of Nalhada, you're gonna you're gonna find it in there. Okay. Well before Lords of Nalhada was written, the idea of going to a place like this became something in 
you know, in our campaign. And so uh, when somebody got up to, to get a coffee, one of the players said, you know, how do you feel about including Narshada? And I said, never heard of it. Give me a, a brief synopsis of, of what it is. So they explained it. And I said, that sounds pretty interesting. I don't know if I'd want to present it that way. Um, when were you thinking of going there now or, you know, in the next couple of sessions? And, you know, everyone was back and involved in this conversation again. And, they, you know, they were all getting up to speed on what this place is. And it was announced, you know, no, we don't really want to go there today, but we might want to be able to go there someday. I said, great. It was a short discussion, very clear. Everybody agreed that they wanted a place like this to exist in our version, our canon of the Star Wars universe. And they liked the idea of me fiddling with it to make it more so. Now, is such a, a modification of the idea necessary? No, of course not. This was just something that I kind of felt inspired to do and the group trusted me to to play with and we had we had fun involving that idea in our universe other times such as the fact that one of the the player characters is one of the last batches of stormtrooper clones we took the idea that the empire had used in its early days or you know the the ending days of the republic had used clone stormtroopers took that idea. It was important to the player's character concept. And while not everybody was thrilled with the idea of how the Clone Wars were portrayed in the prequels, we liked the idea of, of the clones themselves. And so some things are brought in with modification. The way clone troopers were used is a modification. The fact that they exist, not really a modification. How the Clone Wars ran, heavily modified. Um, the inclusion of Nar Shadda, modified, added to. Bounty Hunters Guild, pretty much incorporated as it is. Order 66, incorporated as it is. So, how does this actually work? It sounds a little trite, or it sounds like a platitude to say, talk with the members of your group. In fact, we have kind of a running gag in video responses between me and same old G about talk to the players. But this is a social activity. Setting up a game as a social activity, it will involve talking with people and getting agreements, or maybe negotiating or compromising from time to time. Now, all we did in regard to what was canon and what was not, what was going to be imported or what could be imported from the EU and what would not be, was to say, if there is something out there in the expanded Star Wars universe or in the existing you know, body of films that you want to bring into our game, let the group know. That was it. I made an addition to that as the game master to the players individually. If there's some location that you really like from some aspect of the EU, EU, because I was unfamiliar with it, if there's something from that body of work that you really want to include in the game, tell me about it, and I will do my best to try and, and bring that to life. I couldn't promise to go out and research it heavily and try and emulate that thing. But I would promise to try and bring its spirit into the game. So those two conversations uh, took place. They were set up looking forward, recognizing that during plays we got to know the characters, if we decided we wanted to keep playing Star Wars, that more than the initial preparation we had done would be required. We might have to travel places in that galaxy far, far away that we hadn't considered including or not including before? And did we always want the Game Master to make up their own world? Or did we expect them to always go to pre-existing worlds, either from canon or from the EU, or some level of mixture? 
It's a conversation that needs to be had, and it's a conversation that needs to address the fact that situations of play may cause us to change later. Now, there is also the quality issue. In the expanded universe, there are varying degrees of quality, and there's different perspectives among people with exposure to Star Wars on what that really means. And again, that is a conversation and negotiation between people. You may have some people at the group that really want to bring in something which really irks other people in the group. They're going to have to work it out. There's no way that you can objectively say, and lo, this canonical creation is great, but this canonical creation is crap, and this now with this formerly canonical and now non-canonical creation is great and this other one is crap and you know have reasons have the reasons be based on the group having fun together not someone giving up everything so that someone else can enjoy everything they want you know come to the table expecting to produce a fun experience together have that as your goal now my group that I'm lucky enough to be a part of. That's six adults with busy schedules and different ages and different levels of exposure and different outside interests. We all have this shared interest in Star Wars to varying degrees. We all have this shared interest in role playing to various degrees. We're all willing to make time to meet in an uncomfortable, you know, some sometimes unwelcoming place of, of gaming in, a, in an open coffee shop, you know, playing in public and you know, enjoying ourselves. Enjoyment is paramount. We're all, we're willing to make sacrifices and all these other things in order for this enjoyment to continue. And so it's very important that everyone in the group be able to agree on what's involved. And I think we can see that reflected across most of the tables out there, if we really think about it. And when games break down or people drift away from the game, that can be a reason why. Their, their voice into what is and is not a part of the gaming experience wasn't treated as an equal part of maybe some or the rest of the group. Something to consider. I hope this has been in some way helpful. I'm not sure that it hit all the aspects of the question that were asked, but I tried. If not, engage me in the comments. Let's see what we can do.